The Tampa Bay Rays have called up one of the best prospects in all of baseball, Junior Caminero. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at Sleeper. Swing for the fences with Sleeper Picks, and you can win up to 100 times your money. Download the Sleeper app, use promo code Locked On, and you'll get up to a 100 hour match on your first deposit. Check out Sleeper today. The biggest news from over the weekend, the Tampa Bay Rays have called up infielder Junior Caminero, consensus top 10 prospect in all of baseball, and luckily, somebody I got to watch play in person for a week when I called games in AA Montgomery. They called him up straight from AA Montgomery, was eliminated from the postseason, called him straight up to Tampa. As of time of recording, he has played in one game. He was the DH, went one for four, scored a run. His single was over 110 miles an hour. He is scheduled to be the DH on Sunday the 24th, but we're recording before that game starts. And so what he did this year, 117 games in high A and double A, 324, 384, 591 slugging percentage for Junior Caminero, 31 home runs, 55 extra base hits, 42 walks to 100 strikeouts and five of 10 on stolen bases. The thing about Junior Caminero that I don't think enough people understand or appreciate is he has he hits the ball harder than just about anybody in all of minor league baseball or major league baseball for that matter. His 90th percentile exit velocity is 110 miles an hour. That is the top mark for any qualified minor leaguer. Not counting major league guys who are rehabbing, but anybody who played in the minors for most of the season, that is the highest mark of anybody. And going into two weeks ago, that week of games that I was doing, the stat that we had was he had the fifth most hard hit balls in all of baseball. Not the minors, all of baseball. The list was like Shohei Otani, Ronald Acuna Jr., Vlad Guerrero, I think Aaron Judge, and Junior Caminero. Like, that was the company that he is in. And so, a lot of the popular scouting reports out there for Junior Caminero have him as a 60-grade power or a 65-grade power. And I really think it's closer to... I I think, one, it should be 70. And I think it's probably, if you did a half grade out of that, probably somewhere like 75. The reason that I think you see some of these sites like MLB Pipeline give him only a 60 grade on the power is because he still hits too many ground balls. Like that's an issue that he has to fix and something you're going to see him struggle with at the major league level when he first gets up, I think, and he has to adjust to what professional spin looks. But Junior Caminero legitimately is one of the hardest hitting players in all of baseball. And... He's also right now the youngest player in Major League Baseball. He turned 20 years old in July, on July 5th. So he is the youngest major leaguer. Now, again, they worked him in over the weekend at DH. They're easing him in. The way that things are going in the infield for the Rays, they've got Taylor Walls, who can play second, who can play short, who can play third. They've got Isaac Paredes, who can play first and second and third. And so... Caminero's ultimate best position is probably third base. I think he could be average defensively at third base. He's not in the same tier of the Rays guys like a Curtis Mead or Jonathan Aranda, where they're going to be negative contributors defensively, even at second base. I think Caminero can hold his own at first, uh, can hold his own at third, but he's going to need, at least in the short term, offensively to play a little bit of shortstop with Wander Franco not being with the team. They just have not gotten good offensive contributions 
from anybody at the shortstop position. I think Taylor Walls is batting like 210 or something awful like that. And so defensively at shortstop, I think he's going to be 40 grade, 45 grade. He's not going to be great at shortstop. He's going to be below average at shortstop. But I think defensively at third, he can be at least average. And there's some of the different uh some of the different prospect apparatus has him as possibly a future left fielder because they don't like his defense at third and things like that. that does get better as guys move through the minors. That does get better as guys spend time in the majors. I do think he'll ultimately be fine defensively to be at third base. Uh, I was asked on a different podcast that I recorded Sunday morning, what's a good comp, a good player comp for Junior Caminero? And the everydayers know we don't do a ton of comps on this show, but stylistically, the first guy that I thought of was Jose Ramirez of the Guardians. And Ramirez is probably a better base runner than Caminero is. Caminero is not a bad base runner, but he's not going to give you any sort of value with his feet. Again, 5 of 10 on stolen bases. He was 3 for 7 in double A. It's just not a big part of his game. And I think Jose Ramirez is better as far as running the bases. But I chuckled a little bit when I gave that comparison because to remind everybody, the way that Tampa Bay got Junior Caminero, they did not sign him as an international free agent. He signed with Cleveland in 2019. He played in the DSL in 2021 at age 17. And in 43 games, went 295, 380, 534 with nine home runs and 17 extra base hits. And nine home runs is a lot for the Dominican Summer League. That's not a league where guys hit tons of home runs because they're pretty young. He had 20 walks to 28 strikeouts. And he was traded by Cleveland. They went and got Tobias Myers from Tampa Bay. It was He was a sixth round pick at the Orioles and had looked to be really good, had good strikeout stuff, but it just hadn't put it together yet. And Tampa Bay had a 40-man roster decision to make on him. And so rather than have to give up one of their spots, they traded him to Cleveland, got a 17, 18-year-old in Junior Caminero, and Myers has already been DFA'd by Cleveland, while Caminero is a top five prospect in all of baseball. Something where... Guardians fans have to hate that a little bit, especially when you look at the lack of power in that major league organization and really in the farm system. Other than Chase DeLauder, nobody really profiles to be a good home run hitting guy. And so to lose that for, in essence, nothing, because Myers didn't do anything of note with Cleveland, has to be frustrating. But for Tampa Bay, this is something where he has the potential, mind you, 100th percentile outcome. He has the the potential to bat 280 and hit 40 home runs. That's the kind of talent that Junior Caminero has. This is not a common offensive profile. This is not something you find a ton in your minor leagues. This is special. We talk about hitters are born, not made. Junior Caminero was born as an elite tier hitter, and he's now going to join one of the best offenses in baseball. So... I picked him up in redraft. I'm in my championship week. I picked him up in redraft. Obviously, Dynasty, I guarantee you he's been taken. There's no reason he wouldn't be, but somebody to definitely, he could put up absolutely stupid power numbers while still giving you good batting average numbers and things like that. In just a minute, we're going to talk about hitting fastballs and why it's sometimes tough, as well as how many prospects a major league team has in the first place. And we'll do that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at DoorDash. If you're missing the syrup for your pancakes or you just ran out of your coffee creamer, with DoorDash grocery delivery, you can get what you need right when you need it. It's just the convenience of what you want right to your door. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your favorite meals from restaurants, and now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. Thousands of grocery stores to choose from. You'll find the best produce, meat, whatever it is you need in your neighborhood and help your local economy with each and every order. You get exactly what you ordered. You just sit back and enjoy quality groceries delivered to you. They have easy substitutions right in the app and best-in-class customer support. So get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to a $20 value 
when you use code locked in MLB at checkout. Now, limited time offer, terms apply, but that's 50% off up to $20 with no minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and your code locked in MLB. Don't forget, that's code locked on MLB for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. Okay, so we talked about Matt Mervis last Friday, and one of the things I got wrong, right? I did not think he'd be as bad at fastballs as he was because he crushed fastballs in the minors. And we got asked a question, is hitting fastballs something you can develop? Can you fix that in AAA? Can you fix that in the bigs? And I think it depends on why you're missing fastballs. And to answer another question that came up, bat speed training is not the kind of thing that's going to help you with hitting fastballs. Baseball America just did a great piece about bat speed and what bat speed correlates to as far as statistics. MLB now tracks using the same cameras that they use for StatCast. They track bat speed, so using the cameras. And they went through and they pulled everybody's bat speeds and they pulled their relevant stats to figure out what correlates and what doesn't, right? And so when you look at high bat speeds and low bat speeds, uh, it's something where exit velocity, maximum exit velocity has a very strong correlation to bat speed, which makes sense. The faster you swing, the harder the ball goes. Uh, Home run rate, slugging, ISO power, home runs, a lot of that stuff correlates really strongly to bat speed. But batting average has virtually no correlation with bat speed. So bat speed training can help some of those guys who don't have great power numbers. But bat speed training, if you're already a power hitter, won't do as much as it would if you were somebody who has a really low bat speed, but decent batting average. Luis Arise is a great example of this. I think he was last on the list for bat speed, but he has the highest batting average in baseball. He would benefit more from bat speed training because it would add power, but adding bat speed or subtracting bat speed does not have virtually any correlation to your batting average. So bat speed training, not a thing that would help Matt Mervis. I think the big thing is for me with Matt Mervis, it looks like it's, can you hit major league fastballs? This is a, this is an adjustment situation, right? He has to adjust to the stuff at the major league level. I pulled the numbers for AAA. Remember, AAA is part of StatCast. You can pull StatCast and see a lot of that info if you have access to the data set. In AAA, on fastballs, Matt Mervis hit 284 with a 546 slugging percentage. He hit 12 home runs out of his 22 in AAA off of fastballs. It's not hitting the fastball that's the issue. And I I was a bit simple when I talked about that on Friday. It's hitting major league fastballs. There is a difference. And when you specifically pull, it's a small sample, But when you pull some of the StatCast stuff from his MLB stint, the places that he struggled with pitches on the outer third, he struggled with pitches up in the zone and up above the zone, which is where you would see an elevated fastball, and he struggled with pitches up and in. And the book got out on how to attack Matt Mervis, and it was throw him stuff on the outer half, throw him fastballs up in the zone, and up and in. So you're coming for that innermost quadrant of the nine, you're going for elevating above the zone, and you're going for the up outside corner. Throwing fastballs out there, he wasn't able to be successful on those. And I think some of that is AAA can only go so far, but he's. it feels like he's not necessarily a natural hitter. He's having to work at it. And you don't get good looks at major league quality fastballs with that major league spin rate, and how much ride those fastballs have in the minors. And so Matt Mervis needs more adjustment time at the major league level to adjust to those fastballs. Now, obviously, the issue with that is if you are a contending team, we've talked about this with the Braves, it is hard to give a young player that runway to learn on the job at the major league level. The the Comparison we always make is the Atlanta Braves and their starting pitchers, right? It is so hard for Atlanta to promote a starting pitcher and leave him in the majors when he struggles 
because they are trying to win not only win the division but get the number one seed in the national like in the National League. And the Cubs are contending for a wild card spot, and they cannot take somebody who is batting who or who was batting as terribly as Matt Mervis was and let him learn on the job. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of better options for the Cubs. And so they haven't gotten great contributions from anybody at first base, but just not something where they had the runway to to let him work. And the coaches in AAA Iowa have been working with Matt Mervis on mechanics and different things to help him recognize and be on time for fastballs. But it's not a mechanics as far as the speed of his swing. It's more of mental processing at this point. It is recognizing um, the fastball out of the hand, understanding where it's going to come into the zone and getting the bat there in time. Had a really interesting question about how many prospects does the average MLB team have? This came in response to me talking about guys that are not in the top 30 with the Montgomery Biscuits when I spent a week calling their games. And I talked about guys that are not ranked but are good players. And on average, it it depends on what you define as a major league prospect, right? If you're talking about a guy that will play in MLB, just flat out, he will get at least one game in major league baseball, then the average team has about 35 future major leaguers in their farm system at the start of a season, okay? And that is, again, a guy, September call-up, injury replacement, very few of them will actually spend significant time, but they'll get at least one game. So if that's your definition of a major leaguer, then they've all got 35, a, a, an exceptional team is averaging 40 minor leaguers in their system on any given year. A, t- a poor team is in the mid twenties, right? Now, if your definition of a major leaguer is a guy who will play for at least three years, so that comes out to something 1,500 at-bats, 450 innings, 150 pitching appearances. Then that number changes, right? It comes out to the average team has about 11 three-year major leaguers in their farm system to start a season. And it's the exceptional teams might be around 13 or maybe even 14. And then the poor teams are in the middle to low single digits, right? just not producing very many big leaguers out of their farm system. If you're defining a prospect as a guy who's going to be a future all-star, then you're looking at three to four per organization on average. An exceptional organization may have five. Plenty of teams would have none at any given time. If you looked at me right now and said, hey, I don't know if the Oakland A's farm system has has an all-star, a future all-star in it, it would be hard to argue the point. There's plenty of talented players there, but... That could be a case you could make, or the White Sox, or whoever it might be. And it depends on how you define a prospect, but top 30 lists are very prevalent. And a lot of people I've noticed, and I'm guilty of this at times too, a lot of people, if they're not on a top 30 list, a lot of folks assume that they're just, they have no major league future, or they're not actually a prospect. But in reality, a lot of these players can be prospects. They can play their way into prospect status, If they get the right opportunity, a little bit of luck, some things to go their way, and some good time with the bat or on the mound or whatever it might be. And so understanding that, yeah, we may have a top 30 for this team, but they're going to have 35 or 40 guys in that farm system that will spend one day in the major, especially when you consider relievers and how often teams will bring up a reliever and send them back down you might have 30 or 40 guys at any given time that are going to spend time in the bigs, even if they're not going to be full-on career major leaguers. In just a minute, I had a question about some of the sleeper prospects to be watching for in 2024. Guys who don't light up the stat sheet, but have fantastic numbers and are well-regarded in the prospect apparatus. And we'll talk about that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Sleeper. The MLB playoffs are around the corner, which means the clock is ticking on your chance to win 100 times your cash on Daily Fantasy Baseball. Baseball has never been more exciting than it is right now. Guys like Ronald Acuna Jr. just put up 
one, the fifth 40-40 season in MLB history, the first 40-60 season, and is two steals away from 40-70. All you have to do is pick more or less on stats for those guys like home runs, hits, strikeouts, whatever it might be, for up to a 100 times payout on Sleeper. You get your picks right and you could win big. So, use promo code Locked On, you'll get up to a 100 r match on your first deposit. Now, terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details, but they're currently operational in over 30 states, so check out Sleeper today. Okay, so I got a question the other day about prospects that didn't have amazing stat lines, but the prospect apparatus, different prospect evaluators are really high on their future potential. You know, if you're stout, if you're scouting the stat line, you're not going to see these guys. But who are prospect evaluators talking about? So the two guys I have for you: position player and a hit and a pitcher. The pitcher, left-hand pitcher Henry Lalane of the New York Yankees. Pitched in eight games in rookie ball this year. Five of those were starts. 1-0 with a 4-5-7 ERA in 21 and two-thirds innings. 34 strikeouts, so 14.1 per nine. Two, four walks, 1.7 per nine with three home runs allowed. Uh, As you can hear from the strikeout numbers, from the walk numbers, he has pretty decent uh, stuff right? Fastball sits 95 or so. He can run it up to about 97. Uh, something where it's got a lot of, of, of carry up in the zone. It has good ride as well. And so it's something where a lefty with that kind of velocity and that movement profile is not something you see a lot. Rare right there. He's 6'7", 211 at age 19. So he's got the frame, 6'7", big frame, But again, only 211 pounds, according to baseball reference. So you've got some space there to add a little bit of size to either see if there's some velocity on there or more mass for durability and things like that. He throws a changeup. He throws a slurve. Neither one of them are great. I've seen people like the changeup more. I've seen people like the breaking ball more. But either way, the fastball is at least plus. And again, for a lefty, that is phenomenal velocity. That is not something... There's a lot of major league lefties who are throwing 92, 93. To be sitting 95, 96, touching 97 is phenomenal at age 19. And this Yankees organization, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, this Yankees organization has earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to developing, pitching, taking their prospects, making them better, giving them more weapons, teaching them how to attack horizontally with a sweeper, and things like that. So Henry Lillane, I mean, somebody that people in the prospect apparatus that I have talked to have mentioned this time next year, him being a top 100 prospect. If he's available in your dynasty league, go out and get him. If he, you know, if not, maybe look at making a trade for him since his stats aren't that great. And a lot of these reports talking about Henry Lillane have not really come out yet and has not become a big public push of Henry Lillane. For the position player, another situation where the stats don't necessarily stand out to you is outfielder Luis Baez for the Houston Astros. He's divided his time between rookie ball and A ball this year. Age 19, looked really good in rookie ball. Struggled a little bit in A ball, but all of the tools are there, right? So in rookie ball, 17 games, 271, 434, 661 slug, seven home runs, nine extra base hits, 16 walks to 14 strikeouts in 17 games. Walked almost once a game, struck out less than he walked. One for two on stolen bases. Went up to single A Fayetteville. He's playing almost entirely right field. 61205 is what he's listed as. I think he's a little bit bigger than that, both height and weight. And they're not really having him, he's not running a ton. He's playing right field versus center and focusing on hitting, struggled a little bit more in Fayetteville, right? 41 games, 239, 324, 413. 240 batting average is a struggle now, but 239, 324, 413. Four home runs, 18 extra base hits, 17 walks to 48 strikeouts in 41 games. Another guy that is well-regarded in the prospect apparatus, despite his his 
stat line not necessarily being great. Sarah Goodrum, the farm director for the Astros, had some complimentary things to say about him as far as the quality of his contact, It's as far as maximizing the ability to do that. He's gotten a lot better on not only pitch recognition, ball versus strike, but started to get better at that second level of pitch recognition, the strike versus drivable pitch that I can do damage on. And then he's got the inherent power already. Again, listed at 61205. And in his rookie ball stint, he had cut his walk rate. He had boosted his walk rate from 6% to almost 18%. And he had cut the strikeout rate from 25% to 16 So he did everything right in rookie ball, had a little bit of a stumble in single A. But again, this is one of those situations where it's a 19-year-old kid out of the Dominican Republic who got the largest bonus in the cycle for the team and immediately had to move countries and learn a new language, a new culture, and all of that. These things happen. And he's still an incredibly talented player. Uh, Reports are that he's talented enough to play center field, but they're letting him play right so he can focus on offensive impact. So another guy the prospect apparatus is higher on than maybe necessarily his slash line should tell you that they would be. Fantastic week coming up this week. We're going to talk about the Arizona Fall League rosters. We're going to do a pitching lab show, diving into pitch design and some of that stuff. going to be tons of fun talking about uh, prospects that should impact the postseason in the meantime. If you have questions for us, show ideas, anything like that, tons of ways to get them to us. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, Discord, subtext, tons of ways to get them to us. In the meantime, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. 